Hi, uh, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently have had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture, and we're going to be science-intensive tonight. We're going to start out with Stuart Adams, who died recently at the age of 95. He was a British chemist for the company Boots, which is sort of like the Walgreens of Great Britain, at a time when they were developing their own drugs. And in 1961, he developed an anti-inflammatory drug called 2,4-isobutylphenylpropionic acid. Let's see, you take the iso, the butyl, you bring the propionic over, and then you use the phenyl, and you give it the name ibuprofen. And it not only saved the Boots Company, but in all its variants, it has become the number one anti-inflammatory in the world. Here is the BBC4 Last Words Andrea Catherwood on Stuart Adams, the man who invented ibuprofen. And now to the man who invented a drug you've almost certainly taken yourself. Not all painkillers work the same way as Nurofen. It travels swiftly towards the site of pain. Nurofen, Advil, Motrim, Ibu. Just a few of the brand names of the painkiller ibuprofen created by Stuart Adams in the 1960s in Nottingham. 20,000 tonnes of it are now produced each year. Sophie Clapp is the archivist for Boots. He was very charming. He was extremely humble and really curious to still know what was happening in the business. Back then, Boots the chemist used to make drugs rather than just dispense them. Dr Stuart Adams, by this stage, was a pharmacist leading a research team, but it hadn't been his boyhood dream. No, I didn't know what I wanted to do at all. We lived in March in Cambridgeshire, which is where I started work. With Boots the chemist, I started as a pharmacy apprentice. That meant starting at five shillings a week. I think that's about 25p, isn't it? In 1953, when Adams began the research that would lead to creating ibuprofen, he wasn't looking for a simple painkiller. I was really thinking in terms of a drug for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And at that stage, essentially only corticosteroids and aspirin. And so how long did he work on ibuprofen before he came up with the finished product? 16 years, which is incredible, before it actually came onto the market. He first had his patent after about nine years, so he knew that he was on the right track, really, in the early 60s, but it took several more clinical trials to be able to build the evidence and to prove the safety levels of the drug. Well, I believe during that time he used himself as a guinea pig. He did. I always claim that I did the first clinical trial in the hangovers. We'd had an international meeting in London and I'd gone out with some friends the evening before, and the next morning I felt a little bit the worse for wear. I was first on to speak, and I, I thought, "Why, well, Joe, this is a bit desperate. And so although at that time the usual dose for ibuprofen was 400 milligrams, I thought, well, I'll make sure, and I took 600 milligrams, and it really did work, and I felt quite fine. Do you think that he was very proud of this amazing discovery that, you know, it's, a, it's something that's in almost everybody's uh, medicine cabinet across the world, and yet uh, this was something that he came up with in a front room in Nottingham? He was proud, not because he made the discovery. I think he was proud of the impact it had. Not only that he discovered this drug, but it was a drug that became over-the-counter, and I think that was one of his huge achievements, that it's very rare for a drug to go from prescription only to over-the-counter, and that then makes it much more accessible it was a low price drug so it was totally affordable and it was really effective and so that had a massive impact on millions of people's lives he was proud and rightly so has it made you a wealthy man <laughs> no i'm afraid not <laughs> does that does that annoy you <laughs> no not at all it really doesn't i mean the, getting the satisfaction of, of, of producing a drug that's effective in in a large number of people all over the world is is worth a lot more than mm than some money, I'm afraid. You've well, made them a lot of money. Oh, it must run into hundreds of millions of pounds, I think. I don't know how much. I never dared worked it out. We're going to move on now to another scientist, Walter Monk, who died recently at the age of 101. He's been called the Einstein of the Oceans, one of the top oceanographers in the world. He worked at Scripps Institute for almost eight decades, and he helped develop it into the major oceanographic institute in the world. And he was a major presence at UCSD, for almost seven decades. Here is ABC 10 San Diego reporting on the death of Walter Monk. And known as the Einstein of the Oceans has died. Renowned Scripps oceanographer Walter Monk died yesterday afternoon. 
Monk invented the science of wave forecasting, which helped Allied troops plan amphibious invasions during World War II. Part of the La Jolla Shores Boardwalk was named after him in 2017, and the city of San Diego issued a proclamation that October 19th would officially be known as Walter Monk Day. Well, his special interest was waves, and he played an important part in the Normandy Beach landings in World War II. Here's part of a University of California documentary that describes that. Where do waves come from? Is our planet getting warmer? Can a sinking treasure house be saved? Seemingly unconnected, these are but a few of the questions that have challenged the restless mind of a remarkable man, oceanographer Walter Monk. I have become interested in problems that other people consider noise or garbage. People say, well, that's experimental error, that's garbage, that's noise. But eventually, in my case, turned out into a most interesting problem. And so one man's noise is another man's signal. And if you find that the noise has some interesting geophysical origin, you might learn something very interesting. And I, I suddenly plead guilty to having done so. Although he is virtually unknown to the public, Walter Monk's provocative ideas stimulate scientists around the world and may eventually affect us all. For over 50 years, he has studied and worked at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, part of the University of California, San Diego. He's a major player in world-class science, his giant intellect leavened by a touch of the pixie and old world charm. The oldest oceanographic institution in America Scripps was a small and isolated research facility in the late 1930s. For a time, the fun-loving young man from Austria was the only student in his field, geophysics. After service in the U.S. Army, ex-Corporal Monk returned to Scripps and began a long association with the Navy. As America mobilized for total war after Pearl Harbor, Monk and a small group of oceanographers worked on plans for Allied landings in North Africa. They learned that landing craft were likely to capsize if waves reached a height of six feet. I then looked at the climatology of waves at the landing beaches and found that during the winter months, the landing was a winter landing. They exceeded six feet in two out of three days. And I thought this was a catastrophe in the making. There had never been an attempt to predict waves. So the only way out was really to try and make a prediction and pick a couple of good days to get in. And I worked for a while alone on trying to use uh, weather maps to predict the generation of waves and then predict the decay away from the storm areas and finally the transformation of waves as they come into shallow water. And then asked Harold Sverdrup, who was here at Scripps, whether he would come for a month and work with me. And so we worked together for a long time on this and we did make a prediction for the landing beaches in northwest africa which turned out really rather well two years later when allied troops prepared to invade europe the sverdrup monk theory and methods for predicting waves would be crucial to general eisenhower's fateful decision for d-day 6th of june 1944 countless lives and indeed the course of history affected in no small measure by the pioneering work of a 27-year-old graduate student and his mentor. Here he talks about something I never knew existed, internal waves. Right, we are talking about normal ocean waves at the surface of the ocean. Internal waves that essentially take place at boundaries between warmer, lighter water above and colder, heavier water below. You can very easily see that by taking a tank and putting fresh water and salt water, producing two layers of water in a tank. You can get a wave then at the boundary between the heavy and the light water, which looks just like a surface wave, except it has very little effect at the surface itself. The high amplitude will take place at the internal boundary. So internal waves in the ocean are remarkably high. The boundary, say, between the upper and lower ocean, at several hundred meters, can move up and down a hundred meters, but you'd never know about it at the surface. The surface expression of that is minute. These internal waves are much less well known. They travel much slower than surface waves, but they can have profound effects, as we have learned only in recent years, on what happens near shore. If you have a sewer outfall in the lower, colder water, which we thought would keep it from ever reaching the shore, these big internal waves could transport the 
outflow shoreward. These internal waves can break like surface waves, and we're beginning to appreciate that they are an important part of the general ocean dynamic. When he turned 100, he got a tribute from the Chancellor of UCSD and the director of the Scripps Institute. Walter is the most brilliant scientist I've ever known. He joined Scripps as a young doctoral student in 1939, and that makes him the oldest living alumnus of UC San Diego. Walter has been a great inspiration, not only to the many generations of students at UC San Diego, but also to every chancellor, including me. Walter Monk is a national treasure. He has been a guiding force, a stimulating force, a provocative force in ocean science for 75 years. He's interested in sparking a discussion about what's coming next, knowing that many of the ideas that he could stimulate, he'll never get to see put in place. But the ideas are so important to him, and the future of this field is so important to him, that he's out there pushing all of us to get going, to do it, to think about it, and always focused on the big idea. We're going to move from science to sports now, and Gordon Banks, who died recently at the age of 81, generally considered the greatest goaltender in England football history. He was the goalie on England's legendary 1966 World Cup champions, and he's even better known for a save he made in the 1970 World Cup against Brazil and Pele. Pele had a sure header at close range, and Gordon Banks somehow turned it away. It's often considered the greatest save in World Cup history. Here's ITV on Gordon Banks. When you've won a World Cup, it's rare for your career to be defined by something else. What a save! 1970, the opponents, Brazil, and bearing down on him, the world's best. As the ball left his head, Pele screamed goal. It is still a mystery to most how Banks denied him. People still talk about it wherever I go. It's still shown on television uh, lots and lots of times. Yeah, to me, it was something a bit special. <laughs> Four years before that magical moment, Banks was England's mainstay as Sir Alf Ramsey's team made history at Wembley. He played in every game. His expertise was unrivalled. For six years, FIFA voted him the world's best goalkeeper. And he achieved that status at relatively unglamorous clubs, first Leicester City and then Stoke City. A generous man, he even nurtured the youngster who would eventually capture his England jersey. Gordon, to me, was my hero. I think he was he was somebody I looked up to. His laugh was something I always remember because when, when Gordon laughed, you know, everybody, you could be in two or three rooms away and you'd know it was Gordon Banks, you know, he had that special laugh. At the peak of his powers, his career stalled because of a car crash which cost him the sight in one eye. Uh, I want to keep playing. This is just another hurdle in life that I have to overcome. He attempted a comeback and, while still better than most, could not reach the standards he'd set himself before his accident. So he quit English football and played one season in America. In retirement, he was awarded an OBE and a statue at Stokes Ground, unveiled by his old friend Pele. Today that statue is dripping with scarves. At Banks' feet, flowers, many messages, and all around memories of one of the club's favourite sons. The German national team defeated opponents in the 66 final tweeted today, describing Banks as a fierce opponent and a good man. England's current manager, Gareth Southgate, said he was saddened to hear of Gordon's passing, an all-time great. And Pelé reflected, I am glad he saved my header, because that act was the start of a friendship between us that I will always treasure. Mr Gordon Banks. His last public appearance on the football stage at the World Cup draw in Moscow, when he predicted and hoped... England would do well. Gordon Banks is the fourth member of the 1966 Band of Brothers to die, after Bobby Moore, Alan Ball, and Ray Wilson. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sitep, and it's a final tribute to Gordon Banks. We're going to play a song by an English rock group not well known in the United States, Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick, and Titch, and one of their big English hits, Save Me. Save me, stop what you're doing, you're being my new one, ruthlessly wandering, all my tongue's gone, feel that I'm drifting, image is shifting, my mind is going, where there's no knowing. Save me, save for myself now, save me, save for myself now.
Save me, 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 save me,